Welcome to the Hardware Asylum Podcast Extras. In this episode, we take you to Seafair in Seattle for fast boats, faster airplanes, and the sound cards you grew up with. I'm your host, Dennis Garcia, and with me today, I have Darren McCain. This month in the main show... You may have noticed that we got very technical with the Z790 release from our friends at Gigabyte oh, and yeah. the trip around that. So I thought maybe in the extra we'd be a little less serious and talk about your other trip. My other trip? <laughs> oh, the one that I took a little bit earlier than that to go to Seattle. Excellent. And I know that you were there specifically for hardware-related purposes, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, hardware-related purposes. That's exactly why I went... <laughs> No, actually, I had never been to Seafair in Seattle. Now, our listeners in the Seattle area will know exactly what Seafair is. It's kind of like, hey, we're going to shut down the town and have an event. And the closest thing I can relate it to is the Western Idaho Fair. Which is also a local thing. Yeah, here in the Boise area. And it pulls in farmers and ranchers from all over because it started out as like a way to sell cattle. And then it expanded, so now you have rides and carnies, mm-hmm. yeah, carnies, <laughs> um, food and events, and like uh, you know, you can bring out your beer and have it judged. Oh wow! I feel like everybody has a fair like that somewhere around them. They can probably associate, but mm-hmm. somehow I feel like Seattle probably does it bigger. Kinda. I mean, the Sea Fair. I don't know. Maybe it was an off year or something. But when we got to Sea Fair, we only went one day, and. Uh, <laughs> It was weird because we got tickets, but then uh, the QR code came from a different address and went into a spam folder. So we didn't actually have our tickets. So I had to go to oh no talk to the manager. Hey, I think I can get them for you. Because I paid for um, the captain's adventure or something. I think that's what they call it. Uh, it's a special area where they feed you, which is good because nice. if you go to this event, then you don't have to wait in line for two hours to get food. So they feed you. It's catered. And you had a covered seat, Ooh, yeah. which is important because Seafair is not necessarily like the Western Idaho Fair where you can ride on a roller coaster or whatever. They had some fair food. Boeing is one of the major sponsors. You know, Boeing's in Seattle. And the Navy was there and they kind of had like, you know, uh, come check out our technology for aerospace and you can, hey, apply for a job sort of thing, right? It's kind of a recruitment sort of thing. And then they had a uh, a concert there, a, a little concert dome, which had Navy people singing. So Navy bands, you know, everybody has a band right? growing up. And hey, we're going into the Navy. Hey, I can play a guitar. I can play drums. So they got up there and we're doing like cover songs, which is actually pretty cool. But we were there primarily to see two things. Two things. Two things. Motherboards and video cards. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I went for hydroplane racing, Ooh. which was one of the reasons that Seafair became Seafair was because it was it like the season finale of the hydroplane racing and the Blue Angels flew. Well, that's always nice. It, it was kind of half air show, half uh, hydroplane racing. So they did like a hydroplane race and then they would come back and do uh, like an air show. So they did a, a flyby of uh, like a PBY from World War II. I think there was a B-29. Oh, big boy. And a B-17. They didn't go very fast. They just kind of flew around. So, you know, and... But you don't see those in the air, really. Those are, yeah, those are icons. Yeah, well, and they were from a local museum. So they would literally fly a museum piece as an air show, which was pretty awesome. Uh, They had two EA-18 growlers. I don't even know that I know what that is. Well, you know what an F-18 is, right? Well, yeah. It is the electronic warfare version of that plane. Oh, okay. So like the big domey dish things on the top and all that? No, actually, it, it, it just has extra pods underneath. I had to look it up, actually, because I didn't <laughs> know what it was either. But it's basically an F-18 airframe that has been, um, the armament had been removed. They have just kind of, I think, two missiles to help defend themselves and their gun. But for the most part, all they hold is radar jamming, and uh, electronic surveillance pods. Oh, that's pretty cool. And the Navy had growlers and prowlers before. Um, the prowler, uh, maybe it was the prowler? I don't remember. But it was the jet with the big chin. 
It had the air duct underneath yeah. where the guys were sitting. That sounds really familiar. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think, and of course, if there's any Navy people listening and I get it wrong, just send me an email and tell me how stupid I am. I, I don't know this kind <laughs> of stuff, but it's really cool and fascinating. But uh, anyhow, so the two pilots that were flying the Growlers were having a heck of a fun time. And basically, they were not off afterburner the entire time that they're flying around. So wow. it was just loud and it was <laughs> awesome. And they would come by and, um, you know, you can't break the sound barrier within city limits or something like that. So they were doing the, set, the transonic speeds. So where we were sitting, they were flying over the lake, which is Lake Washington. And you could see the, um, the cone, the, the speed cone as they're going transonic. Oh, wow. That's as, cool. as you're flying by. And it's like, oh my God, that's actually pretty awesome. Like I've seen that in pictures, but like they can maintain that? Yeah. Wow. That was pretty awesome. And then they would get to the end and they, you know, they would pull a high G turn and much like in Top Gun Maverick, where you see the guys going around current and the, the vapors coming off of the wings. You got to see that as they were um, pulling up to go and, you know, reset their run oh, and everything. super cool. But they did a lot of low speed passes, which are probably not legal. Um, <laughs> But it was awesome because that way you could actually see the plane up close. And so they would fly overhead and brrr, and then they would disappear for a little bit and then they would come back. Brrr. And it was, they were having a heck of a lot of fun doing that. And it was actually one of the highlights for me. But then uh, they did more harder plane racing and then came back and at the very end was the Blue Angels. And it was funny because there was people in the, the captain's area where we were that were just there to watch the hydroplane racing. Once the planes flew, they took off. I'm like, you're not here to see the whole thing. They just wanted to see the races. Well, maybe they're big fans, but that's a that's kind of an interesting thing to just do part of it. Yeah. Well, and, you know, this my first time there, so I wanted to take in everything. Of course. Um, and truth be told, I have seen the Thunderbirds fly because uh, as a kid, we would go out to the Air Force Base, which is in Mountain Home, a local city outside of Boise. Uh, take the trip to go out there and then see the the Thunderbirds fly, which was pretty awesome. Um, so I knew what air demonstration was, but it turns out that the the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, while they they're both air demonstration units, they do different um, acts. Yeah, well, that makes sense, right? So then, yeah. you know, you can not see just one of them. <laughs> yeah, but they uh, they're. Some of the, the stunts are the same. So you, it's made up of six planes each. So you have four of them that usually stick together and they'll do like uh, diamond rolls or diamond loops or little flower bursts. You know, the four planes come up and then they fly away and then they come back together, which is kind of cool. And then there was always two stray planes that would go and just do weird events. So one of them did um, a, a low flyby above the little captain's thing so you could actually see the pilot. Oh, cool. It was close enough. You could see the pilot, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and they did a, a, one of those little transonic runs, which was pretty cool to see. But overall, the, they were so far away. And this was probably one of the my um, criticisms of the entire seafare of the air show and the, and the hydroplanes was that they were in the middle of Lake Washington. And if you've ever been to Seattle and seen Lake Washington, it's not small by any stretch. But they were in the middle of it. So while you would get a pretty good vantage point of what's going on, you didn't get a lot of detail. Whereas when I saw the um, the Thunderbirds fly, you're pretty much right on the runway where they're doing the, the um, acrobatics. So you get a really good view of the plane. And you're kind of cricking your neck, looking up and stuff, staring into the sun. But um, overall, it was actually really fun. Well, you talked a lot about the planes, but... I've seen planes. I'm yeah. excited about the hydroplane racing because I've never seen that. Well, aside from the little sprint boats that sometimes run in the rivers here in Idaho. Right. So hydroplane racing is, um, it was big like right after World War II. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of like uh, hot rodding, but on boats. And so the, the progression of hydroplane racing came from just a fast boat to now these specially designed boats that have helicopter engines in the back to run a, a propeller they're all propeller plat uh, they're all propeller boats oh, i did not know that and 
the ones that run now have helicopter engines in them. So the helicopter engine spins and then it runs another pump that goes and runs the propeller. But before the jet engines were in there, they were using ex World War II airplane motors and they used to call them thunderboats. <laughs> thunderboats, I guess, right? Yeah. Big old rocket engines. Yeah, like V12s and they were really loud and rumbly and not necessarily as fast as the jet powered ones. But as part of the event, they brought um, four vintage boats that had been restored by the Hydroplane Museum in Kent, Washington, of all places. There you go. So they there brought out the vintage boats and they just kind of ran them around like four or five times and <laughs> loud and fast. And they, they weren't racing. They were just doing, you know, demonstrations. It's a vintage boat after all. But it was actually really cool to see. But I learned a lot about hydroplane racing. You know, you see them on TV, or at least I'd seen them on TV, and say, hey, these are pretty cool boats. And you see this big jet thing on the back, and you thought, well, maybe they're jet-powered. But they're not. They actually have a propeller. That's part of the rules, I guess. But um, it turns out that the boat itself is made up of, like, three basic components. Okay. So you have the the boat itself, and they're, they use... Um, like a, uh, a catamaran style boat. It's like a tri something, whatever. So you have the main portion of the boat, which is where the propeller is. And then you have these two pontoons in the front that have two wings. So you have a wing in the front between the two pontoons and you have a wing in the back. The wing in the back is set, and I had to look this up, but the wing in the back is set with the boat level in the water. Okay, that makes sense. And the idea here is that the wing in the back prevents the boat from flipping over. Because <laughs> I've seen those videos. Yeah, you've seen them flip over before. Um, the wing in the front is something that the driver can control to lift and lower the front end of the boat. Because as you know, the less the boat touches the water, the faster it goes. And once it gets up to a certain speed, it's basically just skipping off of the top of the water. So they can control that based off of their speed. And... Uh, the next component is the jet engine or the engine itself that controls the propeller. And then the third part of it is actually the body itself because the body itself is a wing, which is where the hydro comes from. Oh, okay. I did not so, know that either. So it's basically an air, it's designed as an airplane wing that floats on the water and, pro, and is propelled by, you know, the propeller in the water. So it really is sort of flying across the surface of the water. I totally see it. Yeah. Now, to make the boat turn, traditionally, you know, if we have an outboard um, ski boat, for instance, right? The You turn the propeller to get the boat to turn. Yes. Now, if you have an inboard boat, which is the engine's inside and it has a solid shaft, there is a rudder, and that's what makes it turn. Sort of directs the water, right? I'm with you. Now, these hydroplanes have a rudder, but... It's really, really small. I mean, you go out there, we got to walk through the pits and everything, and the rudder is probably three feet long by about a foot wide. And you're missing some great gestures here, but I think we got it. I got some, yeah, it's radio <laughs> and stuff. Well, that's not big enough to get the boat to turn. And I was, so I was, okay. well, and there's this, <laughs> there's this other fin that's hanging off of the front of the boat. And I was like, what the heck is that? Because I thought that maybe that was like a uh, like a hydrofoil. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's dragging in the water. In front. Yeah, and that's kind of what I thought it was. But it turns out that it, it has a definite name and it has a definite purpose. And it's called a skid fin. And that's what makes the boat turn. Skid fin. So it's through drag? Well, kind of. So what happens <laughs> is that okay. the hydroplanes, since they're skimming off the top of the water... And they, uh, they just have these two fins that hold them down. There's no fins to turn. So you turn the rudder, that turns the back of the boat, but the boat still goes straight because it doesn't dig into the water because the whole reason that you turn is because you carve into the water and use the water to turn. Okay, now I'm back with you again. I see. Now this skid fin, which is huge, it's like a huge like inch plate that sticks down even further in the water than the rudder does. And there was like seven bolts, huge ass bolts, pardon for the cussing there, but it's huge <laughs> ass bolts that bolted directly to the, the boat. And 
that is what the boat pushes against as it's turning. So as the, as the boat rotates from the rudder, it pushes against that skid fin and that's what gets it to go around the corner. So if you ever see these things racing, you'll see a, um, a rooster tail coming off of the back of the propeller. And then yeah. you see another tail when they turn of the water being pushed off of that skid fin as they're turning around. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to the links that you put in the show notes on this one, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that will, be, that will be fun. So the thing that I noticed from hydroplane racing is that it's not like NASCAR or stock car racing. Oh, how so? Well, the heat races here, at least, they were three laps and... The boats are out there running around in on the track. Okay, so it's not just a straight line then? No, it's around, it's just like an oval, just like a race car oval. So they like have some buoys or something that they have to go around? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. got it. And the drivers are, they rally for position. So there's four lanes or six lanes, depending on how many boats are out there. And they have to figure out what lane they want to be in. And it's all by time. So... <laughs> And they were calling out time. And I'm like, well, why are they calling out time? So they call that 10 minutes. And that's basically, hey, get in your boat and get ready to go. At the five minute mark, that's when you leave the dock and, you know, they fire up the boats and then they're going out. And then they have five minutes to find what lane they're going to be in and then time it such that they're basically at full throttle at the start and finish line. So it's all time. Wow. Okay. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem very fair, but it's, it is in a sense because it gets the driver to synchronize how fast his boat's going and making sure that he's where he needs to be going as fast as he needs to be. But they go around three times and are going like 200 miles an hour. And it, it literally takes them longer to get the race set up <laughs> than it does for the <laughs> race to go. And that was like the biggest annoyance is like, it's only three laps. But by in three laps, they figured out that, okay, this person is faster because they made it through the corner or they washed out one of the other boats because that the skid fin pushes so much water off. So if you're on the outside lane, you're getting splashed with water. It might put out the jet engine or whatever, or push your boat off or rock around. And so it's like, well, you can be on the inside or you can just be on the outside, but ahead of everybody sort of thing. That's like how this lane position thing works. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, Yeah. So it's like the race was over really before it really began because it's like three laps and then the heat is only seven laps or five laps or something like that. And that's when they race all the boats. And, you know, you get a huge trophy at the end and a bunch of money. And I'm like, well, that was a little underwhelming. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but at least the boats sound cool. The boats were awesome. And the Thunder boats, when they got the vintage ones out there, it was just loud and awesome as well. Uh, it turns out that when they were racing, they were going like 180 miles an hour, but they, since there was a gas motor, they could slow down in the corners. So it was more about the boat and the driver than just the boat. Yeah. Oh, well, in the position of the yeah, boat. In the position. And now it's like with the huge skid fin and the jet motor, if you let off on the gas on a jet motor, it takes a while for it to ramp back up. So they made it so that you can just pin the throttle and then just turn. Ah, it's like turbo lag. Ah. Yeah. No more <laughs> turbo lag or in this place, uh, compressor stall. So if you, compressor stall. Yeah, if you run the, like the it. throttle forward and back a bunch of times, you'll stall out Where, the motor. Where's my Honda Racer boys? There you go. <laughs> yeah. Or the F14, right? So ultimately, it was really fun. And it, I was talking with some people that were Seattle natives, and they said, well, you kind of you came to Seafair because of Seafair. But if you really want to watch the hydroplane races, you need to watch them on a river, not on Lake Washington. Oh, okay. Because on Lake Washington, they're out in the middle of the lake. And unless you have a multi-million dollar boat and can dock out by, you, you basically you dock in the middle of the racetrack or something <laughs> oh, like wow. right off the edge and of they, the racetrack. They race around you? Yeah, they race that's like right in front of you and stuff. Super cool. And it's best to see the air show because the planes are directly over top of you. So I see a plan for next year is to try to figure out if you can get on a boat somehow. They got to have tours or something. Well, you know, I'd have to buy a boat. Or I could go to the Tri-Cities. And when they race on the Tri-Cities, it's on the Columbia River. And from my locals who, strangely enough, they, they, strangely enough, in their youth, they were heavily associated with hydroplane racing. Like, uh, the lady was part of Budweiser. She had a boyfriend in, at Budweiser 
So she got to go and see Miss Budweiser race and actually be part of the pit crew. Oh, wow. Which is pretty cool. And then the, <laughs> the husband was a, a crane operator. So he would actually help get the boats in the water. So these guys are these guys are insiders. They're insiders. They knew what was going on. Well, it turns out that when they race on the Columbia River, instead of having this big lake between you, you they race up one bank, they turn around and race down the other bank. So you can literally be on the bank and see the boats up close. Oh, wow, that sounds like that might be worth a trip for sure. Yeah. So that will be something for uh, next year. Go to Tri Cities. It's much closer than Seattle. Uh, and then find a spot on the bank and watch the hydroplane races. Now, I know we joked about this earlier, Dennis, but you really did get some hardware while you were in Seattle. <laughs> I, know, I know you did. Yeah, I did. I went to the REPC, and I've mentioned this place before. It's great. Um, it's one of the the ways that recycling should be. I mean, there is worthless hardware that gets turned in, and then there's stuff that can actually be resold. REPC is one of these companies that goes and will look at what gets donated and make a determination on whether or not it actually has any value or if it really is worthless junk. And then they will go and recycle that. They keep everything else and then resell it. I like to go there because they have a plethora of vintage whatever. Like you can get VHS players. Oh boy. Which is pretty awesome. Uh, Old DVD players. DVD players are not old, but you can get relatively old ones. They had a couple of bins that were just full of remotes. So if you lost your remote to something, <laughs> you can go find it. Um, it's like a treasure hunt. Yeah. Well, and you have power bricks for laptops. They refurbish some old computers, which they're really old, but they're like, um, you know, I think the oldest one I saw was a, uh, like a core two duo or something, which is still a, a valid computer. Yeah. You could surf yeah. the web with that. It's not going to win any speed races, but yeah, you could you do your homework, check your email, you know. Yeah, but you know, for uh, well, I think they were selling it for 150 bucks or something like that. For a full PC, for oh, a full PC bad. with Windows, it's not. For some people, that actually works out really well. For us, we might as well spend that on you know an SSD or something. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the lighting. Yeah, but uh, they had a section for vintage motherboards. That's where I got some of the boards that I brought back. I went there though looking for. A, I think it was a 286 board and then some other case parts for the vintage machines I'm putting together for the YouTube channel. I couldn't find any of that stuff. But what I did find was this. And this is... Well, that's a small package. Radio. But I'm going to show that to Darren there. Card? What do we got? Oh, I know what this is. Uh, get out there. It is a creative sound card. Oh, it's all pretty in gold. It's, oh, this is a nice one. And what's nice about it is that it's a creative X-Fi. We talk about X-Fi a lot because it's the uh, the new technology that they added to simulate a surround sound system in your headphones. Yeah, but, this is really what brought modern gaming into 3D audio. Mm -hmm. And I got this card because of something that Darren started a while ago. <laughs> so he brought over two um, two sound cards from Ozentech. Yeah, kind of the very peak of the home theater sound cards, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And these were cards that you reviewed with Club Overclocker, which you brought them over there on the shelf in the corner. I can go get them if we need to know the names. But Right. Now, it's the Meridian and the Meridian x5 which would be the fancy version of this guy probably possibly if i'm not mistaken oh my gosh it, it's been a while that's scratching cobwebs off right there yeah but the point is i picked up this vi the, picked up this video box. i picked up this sound card because i have this plan to do a sound card through the ages video and article for the hardware asylum youtube channel and also for hardware asylum the the thing that got me started on this, though, was when I bought these retro PCs off of eBay, just about every single one of them came with a Sound Blaster 16. Yeah, that's kind of the era in a nutshell. And those cards were, some people said that they were great. Some people said you needed the special one with like an OPL chip to get the best DOS sound <laughs> and right. stuff, you know, because it was the Yamaha synth. And then creative... Uh, 
pretty much expanded the line from there. So you had like the Awe 32, which is a card that I really wanted for a long, long time. Great, great card. And then like you had the Awe 64, and then you had the Sound Blaster Pro, which was mono only or something. I don't know. I don't have one of those cards, so it doesn't really matter. But the point (laughs) is, the sound cards were great for a reason. And sometimes it was because I could add sound to my 386 or my Pentium machine because those motherboards didn't come with onboard audio. So it was the only way you could get sound. So however it sounded was whatever you got. Later on, we have like Ozentech cards and we have like the Aureal 3D cards. Hercules made one. I can't remember the name of it. It's like the Fortissimo something or other, but it was a 3D positional audio sound card. We have cards like the x like the one that's here. We also have like the Autogy 2 from Creative. Oh, yeah. Those which were had, good cards too. Which had that breakout box so you could plug in optical and full-size uh, headphones and microphones and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. When home theater looked like it was going to go the PC route. Man, I miss those days. Yeah. And sadly, it's now all USB audio, which is pretty crazy. But the my thought is I can set up all of these sound cards in a system and then test them. So I can actually test the audio quality in the way that I test sound cards on hardware solemn right now, run it through a loopback test and actually get like the signal to noise and the frequency response and all the different stats that we normally take for granted that are not normally published on the various sites, especially with the Sound Blaster 16 and the AW64 and stuff like that and actually test these cards and then compare them side by side, you know, hook up some headphones and maybe both of us can go and listen. All right. So this sounds this (laughs) way and we have weird peaks or whatever, you know, our subjective ears. And obviously you hear things differently than I do. So we can kind of put that into the article or the video and that would be our opinion of how this card sounds. That would be a good chance to pull out some of today's modern audiophile headphones and put them through the paces too to see if the hardware can keep up. Exactly. And so I picked up this particular sound card because I want to say that this is really one of the pinnacle cards before onboard audio really started to take over. You know, obviously you could still buy a Sound Blaster sound card that was PCI Express enabled, but by then most motherboards had a really good onboard sound solution that had positional audio and some of them even used creative drivers, which is also impressive. So the idea is that we will put together a video or I will put together a video, follow it up with an article with the technical, you know, charts and boring stuff that some people don't want to view on a video (laughs) and moving pictures and uh, compare the sound throughout the ages. Well, we'll see if our memory matches the real quality of these cards, Mm -hmm. because I know nostalgia is very strong for some folks, especially with some of these cards. I know I particularly have a few that I cannot believe could be bested. We'll see. For more information on the topics discussed in this podcast, please consult our show notes on hardwareasylum.com. Stay up to date on the latest at Hardware Asylum by subscribing to our RSS and follow us on Twitter. This has been an Engineering Production, copyright 2023. Thanks for listening.